zita rangu ndinonzi tafadzwa matamba ndinobva kurungwe ku Zimbabwe I was born deep in the culturally rich but financially and economically poverty stricken overcrowded Hurungwe reserve in colonial Rhodesia This was during the most turbulent years characterized by a fierce liberation war that heralded the final end of British rule to give birth to Zimbabwe in 1980 I should hasten to say that we were socially quite wealthy in family and connections despite our political predicament if you were born in the reserves there was no mistaking life for a box of chocolates you knew exactly that you were going to end up working on a farm or in a mine there was no box no chocolates just people full of hope and driven by faith with a will to survive unless you were fortunate enough to have had read Charlie in the chocolate factory falling of course from the sky on your lap like the ridiculous film the gods must be crazy the cock bottle falling from the plane the only available source of comfort entertainment for a boy like me and actually everyone else was storytelling stories allowed me to dream of places that i would never ever visit stories enriched my life and allowed me to escape the daily grind that was punctuated by manual labor from dawn to dusk and not much play time for a growing boy like me stories and music made working in the maize fields under the africa hot sun a little more bearable and tolerable stories create emotional connections that last forever culturally information customs knowledge and traditions were passed down through stories dances and our own african games like tsoro which sharpened the mind Thank you very much for inviting me to your university to offer this online uh, program as we celebrate a uh, Black History Month to talk a little bit about my recently published book The Journey of the African Storyteller. Mm. First and foremost I would like to acknowledge that I am on the unceded territory of the Kaucha First Nations people. I raise my hands to the First Nations Kaucha people. Haichka, Haichka, Haichka Siem. So you told me you're from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. When did you come to Canada if you don't want me asking? No, that's fantastic. Actually, I came a, in 2012, June of 2012. Okay. So as a magician and storyteller. I after I had met this gorgeous lady in Zimbabwe. So she invited me over. You know, she came to start the culture and the music. You know, I did a tour with her in the schools, you know, since you know, she's a teacher as well. So we went to the schools and and you know we did you know this and that. Then when she came here, 
she invited me to come and share the stories, the music with, with the community. And that's how I came to Canada in 2012. So there's a beautiful love story in this mm -hmm. African <laughs> Oh yeah, it's it's kind of like a road. some romance, definitely. It's a little bit. Please. Tiptoe with me through the jungles, lest we wake those sleeping lions. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to arrive into this beautiful paradise, a land between two great rivers, the Limpopo and the Zambezi. Yes, and there you are going to find one of the most spectacular places you can ever see anywhere in the entire world. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about one of the seven wonders of the world, Mosi Obatunya, the smoke that thunders. Yes, the smoke that thunders. Popularly known as Victoria Falls because of one explorer by the name of David Livingstone who claimed in 1855 to have discovered Mosi or Atunya, the smoke that thunders, which he named after Queen Victoria. You mentioned a little bit about your background here and in that you said that you did cultural tours in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so while you were exploring your culture and presenting it to the tourists, did we experience any dangerous animals <laughs> along the way as well? Uh, yes and no. Oh. Yes, but I would have to tell uh, you guys before we go, when you come to your tour, I will have to tell you a few basics. Even like now, everyone, I'm giving you this for free. This is like just information. You must know that the hippo, the hippo is like crazy. It's really, it's cute. I know here you guys want to say animals are cute. The hippo <laughs> is cute, but it is dangerous. You see, the elephant is huge and gentle and cute, but dangerous. The lion, oh, it's so cute. Like, you see the man, you see, like, it's so cute, but dangerous. The buffalo, mm, just can, can you please avoid the buffalo? Because <laughs> I can, if, absolutely. <laughs> if you can avoid the buffalo, then you are good. So, how you remember that? Help. H E L B. The hippo, the elephant, the lion, the buffalo in that order but yes you should always be just be watchful it's like here the bear when it has got a baby why are you going there the bear is having a nice time with this baby and then you are going there so don't do that well i think we have some very important information here one don't poke the bear or the lion or the hippo <laughs> or the why, buffalo why are you or the poking? elephant why are you poking the <laughs> elephant <laughs> Sleeping, so that's why I say, come with me, tiptoe with me into the jungles of Africa, lest we wake those sleeping lions. Let the sleeping lions rest, right? Ladies and gentlemen, I am taking you way back in time. Come with me to the winter of 1977. It is during the night. I am only one week old my mother is running away with our lives from the war two days after we leave our little shop which served also as our home it was bombed and it bent to the ground nothing was recovered as we were running away i was later to learn that my mother was exhausted. 
she was carrying me and my other little sibling and two more siblings so it was a hard time so she really was exhausted and slept while sleeping a hyena came and picked me i screamed that's how she woke and she had to wrestle that hungry hyena with her bare knuckles my mother is my hero I am sincerely grateful to my father, not just for the gift of life, but also mbira and country music. When I was just a little boy, I would listen to my father play mbira music on his njari. I was also fortunate to listen to the traditional country final records he had collected and occasionally played on the record player under the bright African stars. I will never know how my father got hooked to country music, but I'm so grateful that he introduced it to me at a very tender age. In my early teens, a dear friend had just bought a record player and borrowed the records. A few weeks later, during a rainstorm, the roof of their house gave in and all the records were destroyed. While I cried that what was to be my inheritance was destroyed, I had listened enough to the music that it stuck in me forever. As we played at Sunfest, people watching, I wondered if my father was sitting in heaven with his favorite musicians, Johnny Cash, Jimmy Reeves, Patsy Klein, and laughing. When you are born in the village, Life is not easy. You have to go to fetch water and it's many, many miles away. You have to fetch firewood. You have to work in the fields. At times you have to work before you go to school. My mother would trick us using songs. She would start singing. At first we would ignore her. We would be so grumpy. <laughs> When she starts singing, before we even knew it, we would be singing with her. And it really made the work a little more bearable. As a little boy growing up, I would say, when I grow up, I want to run away from the village. I want to go as far away as is possible. And yes, that is what happened. I went away as far as possible from Maumbe and came to Canada. And guess what? I am farming. Mauya, Mauya. Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Technology is for me, it's like, wow. <laughs> I am amazed, amazed, and amazed. I'm flabbergasted that I can be reaching you through this online platform and share a little bit about my recently published book, The Journey of the African Storyteller as we celebrate Black History Month. It was quite an honor for me to have a ceremony for my job, Canadian citizenship, on the unceded territory. 
of the culture and First Nations people. The yeah, area was honored with this blanket. I was also honored with this, uh, you know, took. Mm, that was really very special for me. To have a traditional ceremony. Hello. Hello, is this African Storyteller? This is the African Storyteller. Hello, I'm the head of our pack in Parksville. Really hoping that you would come and share your amazing book and poems with our students here at the school. Wonderful. When do we have a date? Next week would be wonderful so that we can do it for Black History Month. Awesome, I'm honored to be invited. Wonderful, thank you so much. The children are gonna love your poems. Zimbabwe Farm's first ever folk tale series featuring all the very best of folk tales coming from pre-colonial Zimbabwe. I realized ever since I was a little boy that the best storytellers were the ones that would also use music to share their stories. <laughs> Hey, my name is Brandy Gallagher. Here we are at our eco village, and I can remember when I first met you, Tafazwa. The Zimbabwean music camp was here. We all gathered, and I think that you were called here for some bigger reason. So, yes, you spent your first day in Canada here, but there's something I think that calls you between you and the Kawitsan people. I had the opportunity to read the story of the ant, the elephant, and the pumpkin to my preschool classroom. Hello everybody and welcome to today's show. So this month we have a lot of exciting things going on. We have Valentine's Day, everyone's celebrating love, love is in the air. But it is also very important to recognize that it is Black History Month. So today I have a very special guest we have the African storyteller himself. He's promoting his book, The Journey of the African Storyteller. It's been recently released, be climbing to the chart. So it is a must read, and here to tell us all about it is the African Storyteller. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I am taking you way back in time. Come with me to the winter of 1977. It is during the night. I was born on June 10, 1977 in then Rhodesia. Zimbabwe before independence was called Rhodesia. It was a British colony. The night that I was born, my mother tells me that uh, there were some helicopters that arrived, landed the nearby school, and everybody went to see what was happening. And everybody was told that now that there was a curfew, nobody was supposed to be seen moving during the night. And that day, during the night, even though I was due 11 months, <laughs> I didn't want to come out. I want to stay here, I want to stay here. My mother went into labor. She was on her own. I had the superior power to receive me because there was no one uh, that my mother could uh, call because people were not allowed to walk during the night. Hi. Hello? Yes. Personally, I'm calling because I'm a mom of three myself. And I can see myself there. I mean, can you even imagine being the mother of three children, ages six, four, and two, and expecting a fourth, the little African storyteller himself, and two full months past his due date to boot? I mean, wow. <laughs> there are no words. And to think that this was going on during the height of the Liberation War. To think that out of nowhere, a helicopter carrying Rhodesian armed forces just landed at the primary school in their village. And overnight, their lives were changed. They set a curfew at night and warned the villagers that if anybody stepped outside of their homes, they'd be shot. I mean, can you even imagine? It's just mind boggling. Here was this poor woman in labor and unable to send anyone outside of her home to get help for herself. And to boot, her husband is out of town that night, working and completely unaware of the events unfolding in his village, let alone his home. So she was left completely stranded and isolated with three small children and in labor with the fourth I mean, this is the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> she must have been terrified. I mean, the incredible strength and courage she must have had to get through it all. I mean, how else could she have survived it? What a brave soul. <laughs> The whole story is just mind-blowing and miraculous and personally I think she was a real hero. This is my favorite poem from the African Storyteller. So much pleasure that fills my heart, I fear it could explode. As I stare at the beautiful stars that never fail to reach down to my heart. Even when I am down and out, never faltering and always faithful. I thought that inviting the African storyteller to our school district would share some simple things that some may take for granted. For example, that Africa is actually a continent not a country. There are 54 countries in Africa. As the assistant superintendent, we're putting our efforts into enlightening our students about other cultures, and we are fully utilizing Black History Month by sharing a few stories from Zimbabwe. Chris? 
I'm Jen. And we're from Mill Bay, BC. I can say that it's my honor to be one of the first Canadians to be able to call my friend. So this is an original Tefatsua Matamba drawing, uh, which we received in, at Christmas time, 2013. And we've just met Tefatsua. And now look at him, he's going to Nashville and singing in country music festivals. Come pretty far from a long ways away in rural Zimbabwe to singing country music at music festivals in Canada and the United States. Hey, my name is Adam Knight. I'm the president of AOK Records here in Nashville, Tennessee. And I am proud to be here today producing Mbira Spirit to Fadzwa and Amy Matamba. This project is going to be incredible. It really captures the soul of traditional country music with the twist of the African storyteller. And I believe you're going to love I Saw the Light. I wandered so aimless, like we'd we'd seen I would do, let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like an angel in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light, I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow. I first met Tafadswa while working at the food bank. And the moment I looked at his smiling face and his pleasing demeanor, I realized we had a connection. I, at that time, I didn't know what the connection was, but I felt as if I had already met him sometime in my life, or he was going to be in my life. As time went by, and I got to know Tefazwa and Amy, we had uh, social times together, we danced and sang, and we did folk dancing. It was, it was a really lovely time, and every time I met Tefazwa, always my heart just opened right up, as if he was someone, like I say, someone in my family. I really, really cared for him a lot. One day, I came across a bracelet, and this bracelet was unusual, and it had the most amazing eyes. It was a lion sitting on top of a bracelet. And I would love to give this to Tafazwa. Coming from Africa, a memento of his homeland, something that he can relate to. Most of us cannot relate to lions. So I presented it to him and he was overjoyed. As uh, I continued to speak with Tafazwa about this, this lion, um, I found there was an interesting fact that came to life. And this fact was that his grandfather was known as a rain, he was a rainmaker. He had a spirit, the spirit of a lion. When he saw it, he was overjoyed. He said, this is my grandfather's spirit and that story is just it, it just makes me uh, quiver because it's such a beautiful story so another thing that we did is I wrote an article for Tefazwa about his village in Africa. I had once been a writer for a uh, paper in Northern Alberta, so I asked Tefazwa if I could write his story. One thing that kept coming across in the story was his mother. And I know he misses her deeply being on this side of the world. 
When I look at him, I clearly can see his mother. And if his mother and he are really alike, then she must be a beautiful person too, because Tefazwa, I love his smile. I love his generous spirit. I love the fact that he is, he doesn't give up. He will, when he, when the, when things get tough, I notice he just, with a smile, will keep on going, yes, he will um, probably get a little down, but then he writes his poetry, uh, is a great photographer as well, and he's a storyteller. His stories are absolutely phenomenal. Uh, he's got so much talent in this one person. His spirit is just overwhelming. It takes over. So I am so grateful to have been blessed in my life to have met such a lovely man as Tefadzwa. I'm Ray Jan, and I'm calling from Salt Spring Island. I started out meeting Tefadzwa when he came to Canada to visit with Amy and to see the West Coast. And at that point, I got to play lots of music with Amy and Tefadzwa. And I had the chance to meet Tefadzwa's family when I went to Zimbabwe in 2013. It was fantastic to be able to see where Tefadzwa's roots come from. The trip was amazing. The people were amazing. Tefazo's family were all wonderful and it was a really life-changing trip. Pender Island. Gabriela Island. Salt Spring Island. Cortez Island. Oh my god, I'm so glad I got on. Um, so I was just listening to your segment on the African Storyteller I was driving, and I had to pull over and call because I had the funniest thing happen to me. Just a couple weeks ago, I was at my aunt's wedding, and the African Storyteller was there playing with his band. They were amazing, everybody loved them, it was a great wedding, um, but my daughter, who's about four at the time, goes up to him while he's on stage, and he was just taking a break and had a minute, I guess, and she says, sir, are you hot? And I'm not sure where that came from or why she was asking him. And I can't really, I didn't really hear what he said. So I went up to her later. I'm like, baby, you know, why are you asking that man if he was hot? <laughs> and she says to me, oh, well, Auntie Penny kept saying how hot he was. So yeah, great guy. Awesome band. Super hot, according to Auntie Penny. Out of the mouth of babes. Tifa, I've traveled the world. What can I do if I went to Zimbabwe? What are the tourist attractions? Well, the one, the one of the seven wonders of the world is Mosi Oatunya. Oh. Yes, so Mosi Oatunya, that's the Victoria Falls. Oh. One of the seven wonders of the world. Beautiful. It's oh, it's so like amazing. I will go there. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I'll say Tifa sent me. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The journey the, uh, of the, the African, African storyteller. Story Hi, Haley. Hey. How's it going today?
going pretty good. Wow, another day on set is big ground. That's right. Oh. So tell me about life growing up in Zimbabwe. Hmm. Wow. Wow, wow. It's totally <laughs> different from here. Of course, you know, like from the simple things that someone here might take for granted, like water, like mm. we have here with running water, even like shower, hot water. So there's really, not, you know, so where I come from, there's no running water. Even still now people have to like to walk like miles and miles to get like drinking water and for their domestic purposes. Some have even to go and wash their clothes in the river. So would you help with that as a kid, getting water? Yes, yes, that was really hard work, you know. As a kid, you want to go and have fun, but now you've got to like, get these containers and like... Oh. Tell me about this town or village, should I say, that you grew up in? The, my village in the capital city. Mm -hmm. It's like two different worlds, you know, night like... And yeah, night and day. Yeah. So it would have been the 70s, right, when you were a Yes, kid? I was, yes, yes. During the height of the liberation, oh, I could even have died mm -hmm. from the war. And also, when my mother was running away from the war with us, a hyena grabbed me during the night when apparently we were sleeping. And I screamed, then she got up, so she had to fight that hyena with her hands. And wow. so otherwise, I could oh have, <laughs> I know, I could have. I been, can't even imagine that. I could have, been, I could have been like a no-show. I could, yeah. yeah, we could not have met as background actors. <laughs> well, so, we need you here. <laughs> wow, what a story. I know, I know, right? That's been terrifying. So you were really young. Yeah, I, I, was, I just had been born maybe less than a week. Yeah, I was Aww. just a newly, newly by now. <laughs> From? Hey, I'm from uh, Zimbabwe. Orini is African, right? Yes, it is Africa. Oh, what's your name? My name is uh, Tafadzwa. Oh, Tafadzwa, I'm, yes. Oh, I'm Angel. Oh, nice you're Angel. You. Nice yeah, to meet you, nice Angel. To meet wow. You. So, where are you from, Angel? I'm from China. Oh, yeah. oh. So, when did you come to Canada? About 13 years ago. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. So, same time here in Canada in 2012. So oh. now 10 years. Wow. Yes. How are you enjoying Canada? Oh, I love it. Oh, <laughs> Canadian yeah. is very, very, um, they are very sweet and uh, yes. very nice. They are very nice. Yeah. Yes. I'm grateful too, oh, to be here. Oh, me too. You know, I, I'm, I'm the guy, the first time I come here, and it's just totally everything strange for me, but uh, totally no good. I feel so warm. I don't feel I'm in the um, strange country. Yes. I love it. You yes, know. me too. Me too, Angel. I love it. The oh people are so nice. Yeah. Wow. Canadian are the best. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I say it's the best people. It's the best people for yeah, sure. Yeah, they're yes. always, you know, so nice, so sweet. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The journey of the African storyteller. Hi, I am so honored to meet you, the African storyteller, and I have a question for you. So in Canada here, um, my name is Trisha Toth and I work as a clinical counselor oh, wow. and mental health is a priority to me. So I'm wondering how people in Zimbabwe deal with their mental health or how they care for themselves. Wow, that's a very good question, Trisha. In Zimbabwe, through the music, I can say, ever since I was young, uh, the music has really uh, played an important part in helping with mental breakdowns. He, I started seeing it when I was really young. My mother would use music uh, while we were working in the fields. It was really hard work. So the music and even going to fetch water, the music is there. Going to fetch firewood, there's so much music there. Whatever you are doing, even from way back in time, going out to hunt, the music is there. At times you catch something, at times you don't. Again, there are songs to take you through the, the pain of not having heard anything when you go out hunting, or be it loss when a loved one passes on. It's the music that comes in to do the healing. And maybe times even birth, the music comes in, people are celebrating, and be it maybe a harvest ceremony, the music is there. So maybe someone's not feeling well, you're doing a healing ceremony, the music is there again. So I would safely, without any flinching doubt, say that music is the medicine. 
that really has helped us growing up in the village because we don't have like more alternative uh, like uh, more western medicines you know like so we rely on our like the herbs but music is the well, and you can always take that with you, right? Wherever you go, it's internal. And it's really happy to hear that because I, I share that opinion with you that it's something I enjoy in my own life. It's very healing and it's just a great way of expression and release. And yeah, wow. that's awesome. That's amazing. That's yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Nice talking to you. Yeah. Nice talking to you. Wonderful. Nice meeting you. you. Yeah. Nice, yes, nice meeting you too. You have a wonderful day. Thanks. You too. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I'm really sorry, but I don't even know what your first name is. I know. So it's so complicated. It's Tafadzwa. Tafadzwa. Yes. Oh, what? Tafadzwa. That's it. Like you know. Tafadzwa. That's it. Tafadzwa. So oh my gosh. So it's been so nice talking to you today. But please, Tafadzwa, tell me what was it like growing up in Zimbabwe? It's beautiful in its own way, but totally different from Canada. You know, like a shower, you know, like. Bath, you know, like, like some coffee, you know, like yeah, there are some things, you know, that one oh, yeah. might take for granted, you know. Mm -hmm. So that I think that's the major difference: it's the lifestyle, you know, like it's the, it's the, the materials, it's the means. Do you find that you have a better connection with the earth because of how close you had to move to it? Yes. So like now, uh, I'm so grateful. I I, I I I see no reason to complain, even on a waste day. It's see, everything is still fantastic. There's right. always food at the end of the day. That's like cool. even now I'm having a puchy problem. So I know I'm, I never even thought I would have it. I would say that like wow, like there's like so much food. So I think that's another thing that like there's so much food around and, and, and not as much. Mm -hmm. You know, in Zimbabwe things are a little hard. You have to forage. You have to you have to go find your food. Yes, Where you, here it's delivered to you. It's delivered to you. Yeah. So that's again another yeah. different. So that is something that when I came to Canada I saw that the food was coming, you know, like from all over. See like just like unlike in Zimbabwe you have to you have to do that yourself. There's no food that's gonna come from somewhere that Zimbabwe was once the bread basket of Africa. But now it can't feed itself. So things can just like change from yeah. very fantastic to depending on harvest and depending yes. on climate change. Yeah, climate, yes, climate, climate change has been right? hard, so there's been droughts and things like that. So it's been like, oh wow. I'll tell you, I have a garden in my own yard, and every year I do a week where I eat what I sow, wow. and so I really eat a lot of tomatoes and carrots. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it is because I want to teach my children. I want to teach yes, them that it takes yes, yes, sowing the seeds in order to reap that's the reward. That's it. Yeah, even right? we are doing a program called Seed to Belly. Nice. So we sell that's seeds, you know, like we, we collect, you know, seeds, tomatoes, pumpkins, turnips, uh, you know, things like that. Kale, you know, like so we, you know, like we just try it again, you know, to encourage other people to grow as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Canada, for this opportunity to share the journey of the African storyteller and give people a glimpse of the situation on the ground in the village of Maumbe, where I come from. I hope that by sharing this story, I might be able to get the opportunity to uh, drill some water wells in the village that I come from. Water is such a challenge. Ever since I was a little boy, it was a struggle, and it is still a struggle up to this day. Thank you, Canada. There's a bit of a vortex has drawn us all together, and somehow, some way, there's going to be what's next in the story of the African storyteller. I raise my hands to the couch and people whose territory I am honored to be able to present the journey of the African storyteller, Haicha. I wandered so aimless, like we'd we'd seen I would do, let my just savior in. Then Jesus came like an angel in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light, I saw the light. No more night Now I'm so happy No sorrow inside Praise the Lord I saw the light Just like a blind man I wandered along Worried 
I was a fool to wander astray, for straight is the gate, and I rose the way. Now I have traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more.